Hey everyone, thanks for joining me on Someone to Play Games. My name is Lance, and today I'm going to teach you how to play Death May Die. This is a new game from Come On Games. It is a 1-5 to five player game that takes roughly 1-2 to two hours to play, and is a fully cooperative game, so all the players are working together to defeat the scenario they've chosen to go on. Please make sure that you have your Klingon text turned on, and if you do, you should have a little text at the bottom of the screen. This way I can update you throughout the video if there's any rules corrections that I need to make, or any other things that I need to point out that I've missed during the production of this video. If you find these videos helpful, if you like what I do, please consider that like button subscribing to my channel, because it really does make a big difference. It helps me to continue to grow and produce these videos. If you want to stay updated on all my videos, also consider ringing that bell so you get notifications anytime I release new content. So let's head to the table, and I'll teach you guys how to play. There are two different sets of dice included in the game. The first set we have are the standard black dice, and you'll roll these whenever making tests. Each of these die is going to have two sides with an explanation point, which are going to count as successes one side with a blank, one side with an elder sign, which is going to be considered a blank unless you have a skill or card that says that you can count that as something else. And then you'll have a side with a tentacle on it. Each time you roll one of these, it is going to take one point away from your sanity, and I'll show you more on this later. And then finally, there's one side with both a success and a tentacle. Moving over, we have the green bonus dice. And you'll get to add these to some of your attacks or enemies will use these as well. And you'll have each die is going to have two sides with a success, one side with an elder sign, one side with a success and an elder sign, and two blank sides. To start an episode, you're going to select one of the episode boxes to play. And each episode box is going to contain its own set of mythos cards, discovery cards, potentially special tokens, its own episode card, which is going to outline the details of the mission that you're going on and the different objectives that you're trying to meet, as well as the special abilities or actions you can take during your turn. And then finally, its own set of minions or monsters that are going to be included in this episode. Each episode mission card is going to list the name of that episode on the side, a quick little backstory to that episode, what you'll have to do to disrupt the ritual, and anything that happens when the Elder One advances. Then at the bottom of the card are going to be two special actions that the investigators can perform during this episode. And each one of these will outline what you need to do in order to do that. On the back of each episode card is going to be a map that lays out the mission and how you set up the tiles and all the different enemies and tokens you'll need for this. Each episode monster card is going to list the name of the monsters on the side of the card, the image of the monster, the number of hit points that it has, any special abilities that monster has, as well as the dice that it's going to roll when it attacks investigators. The Mythos cards are going to be comprised of two separate decks of cards. You'll have some from your episode and some from the Elder One that you've chosen to play. Each of these decks is going to be comprised of two different types of cards. The first type are going to have the Elder One summoning symbol in the center of the, of the card, and this is going to have no effect when the card is drawn, but later on in the turn this will be checked, and though certain conditions are met, it'll cause certain things. From there, each card is going to be resolved from the top down, activating each area and resolving its effects before moving down. Each card will start with the name of the card, and then the effect that you'll resolve. So, for example, with this one we have Fire Vampire, and it says the nearest fire vampire is going to move two spaces towards you. And you in this is always referred to the active investigator, whoever's turn it is. Then you're going to place one fire token in its space. Finally, at the bottom of the card, you'll summon a new fire vampire into the blue summoning circle, if there are any available. With this one over here, you'll follow the directions on the top part, completing them to the best of your ability, and then summoning again at the bottom of the card, again to the best of the ability. If both of the, the fire vampires are out, for example, then you would not have to summon a new one. Same with the Biaki. And the final set of cards you're going to find in the episode box are the discovery cards. These are going to provide investigators with ways of gaining items, companions, and conditions. Some of these will be good, and some of them will be bad. Each card is going to have a name in the center, and then you'll read the text in the middle of the card out loud. It'll give you a little bit of a backstory, and then a lot of the cards will provide you with a choice that you must make and conditions you must meet, such as this one, you may take one wound to claim either the Furious Student or the Pistol. If you are not able to follow the effects of the card or you choose not to, you'll simply discard the card. From there, then, if you decide to take a wound, then you'll get to choose one or the other. If you take the Pistol, it is considered an item and will provide you with the instructions on how to use it. 
If you take a companion, it'll list their name, any special abilities or instructions that that companion gives you, and a lot of companions will also have a number of hit points, and you can choose to have your companion take a wound instead of yourself. When a companion receives a number of wounds up to their wound total, then they are going to be discarded from the investigator. Finally, conditions are going to provide the investigator with either certain parameters or effects, or they'll be triggered later in the episode based on mythos cards and whatnot. After choosing the episode you want to play, you're also going to choose an Elder One box. Each Elder One box is going to come with an Elder One, a, any miniatures that are associated with him, any tokens, his own set of Mythos cards, the four stages of an Elder One, and their bonus minion monster card. The only new set of cards in the Elder One box are these stage cards, and these will govern the different abilities that the Elder One has. Each of these will list the stage number on the side of the card and the name of the Elder One, and then when the effects of the card are going to be triggered. With Stage 1, it is mainly going to handle the advancements on, with the Elder One advancing on the summoning track. Each time it advances, you'll resolve the effects of the card. Once the Elder One is, comes out, either from disrupting the ritual or from him meeting, reaching a certain point on the summoning track, you'll reveal the next card, which will have his hit points, his dice when he attacks, and a special when revealed effect that will only be resolved when he is revealed. Then it'll also have different things that'll come into play during the turn and those again will outline when those will take play and what they're going to do. Each time you defeat a level or a stage of an Elder One, you're going to keep this card off to the side and the next card that's revealed, which I don't want to reveal too much, will add dice to this card and another ability or effect. So they will stack and it will get nastier and nastier as the stages progress until you're either able to defeat the final stage or you die trying. Moving over to the investigator boards, first I want to go through the features. So on the top of the board is the sanity track, followed by a quick reference guide to the turn order, your investigator's name and image, their stress and wound tracks, their three skills that they have, and finally areas that they can dock their discovery cards, which will include items, companions, and conditions. Now I'd like to go into some more detail about a couple of the features on the card. So first with the sanity track, you're also going to notice these red areas, which are insanity thresholds. Some of these thresholds are also going to have a green die underneath them, and each time you hit or pass one of those areas, for the rest of the game, this investigator is in, they will get to roll a green bonus die with their rolls. These thresholds are also going to allow you to upgrade one of your skills of your choice each time you hit one of them throughout the game. The one other important feature with these is, let's say that our sanity track was here, and we received this result on the dice. Anytime you get results that will have more sanity damage than it'll take to get to a threshold, the rest of that damage is disregarded. So we would add two damage and the third one would be disregarded as we hit that threshold. So you must stop on a threshold. And then you're gonna resolve the insanity card's condition as well. And I'm gonna cover this a little bit more in just a minute. Then from there we have the stress track. So anytime in, during the game, you can spend a stress to move it down and then reroll one die of your choice. And you can do this any number of times as long as you have stress to take. Another feature are the skills. So each investigator is going to have a signature skill, which is their top skill and is unique to that investigator. With each of their skills, you'll have the starting levels. And then as the player upgrades those skills, they'll move their markers along the track. Some of these skills will replace the original result with it saying instead, other skills will stack on that original result, adding more and more to it, making the skill better and better throughout the game. If you're confused about these as well, Simon has released a compendium that gives a full breakdown of each investigator and lists each area what all of the features of that area are. So it's really handy for players that aren't quite sure how to add these or what is included in each level. And I'll have a link up in the top corner for that. Finally, we have the areas for the discovery cards and there is no limit to the number of discovery cards you can dock in here. So let's go ahead and say that we had a companion that we locked in here first and then we picked up a second one. We can add them as well, just simply adding them along that track. Is there, there is no limit to the number we can have. 
And the final thing I want to cover before moving into setup are the insanity cards. At the beginning of the game, each player is going to be dealt one of these randomly, and these are going to be the condition that the player is going to have to trigger when they hit the insanity thresholds on their investigator boards. And then when you do, you'll simply follow the directions on the card. Some of these cards can be really nasty or very helpful to the players depending upon how well they're able to use them or take use of them or plan their turn out so that they potentially trigger them at the right opportunities. For board setup, first off, you're going to choose an episode that you'd like to play. So I'm going to go ahead and set up for Blasphemous Alchemy, and this is the very first episode. Then you're going to follow the back of that episode's card and that details all of the setup instructions, placing out all the different tiles that you need and all the miniatures and tokens as located on the board. Any remaining miniatures that you're not using in, during the initial setup will be placed off to the side for this scenario and will be used for the different spawning points. Any miniatures that are not included in this will be kept in the box, as those will not be used for this particular scenario. Next, we're going to set up the storyboard, so then we'll place out the episode card face up this time showing the two different actions you can perform then the episode monsters that are going to be used based on the episode you're playing and the elder one minions that are going to be used based on your elder one then you'll stack the elder one stage cards late stages one two three and four on top of each other and then place that there Finally, you're going to go ahead and grab the token, and this is optional. You can keep this off to the side until the Elder One is summoned. I like to just put it underneath him and then place him on the first spot on the story track. Once he moves to the first space in the red, his miniature will come out onto the board, or there's other circumstances that will cause him to come out. And then at that point, then this token will be used instead. Next, you can place out all of the dice in that you're going to be using for the game and all the other tokens and for this video i'm going to be using crystal fortress pod sets if you'd like to know more about those there'll be a link in the description below to their website then go ahead and shuffle up the discovery cards and place those out as well as the mythos cards you'll have eight for the elder one that you've selected and eight from the episode that you selected add those together and shuffle up that deck as well and place that out next for player setup each player is going to select one or more investigators that they'd like to play as once a player is selected an investigator, they'll choose a color for that investigator and place that clip on, that, on their miniature. And then they'll get the six tentacle tokens for that, placing one on their sanity, stress, and wound tracks, and then one on each one of their skills on the very first spot. Next, shuffle up the insanity card deck and deal one to each player. This will be their insanity for the game. And these can be kept face up as this is a cooperative game, so all the players will know what the other players have and will hopefully work together to try to minimize the effects of those cards or maximize the effects depending upon the type of card they have. Finally, the players will place their miniatures out in the starting location and choose one player to be the starting player. And you can do this in any manner you want to. So I'm going to go ahead and have Elizabeth start us off. And you can hand that player the Mythos deck, making that player the active player. Or alternatively, if you have another token or you want to use a miniature or something to represent that, you can do that as well. From that point on, it'll start. the game will start with that player and proceed in a clockwise manner, activating each player in turn where they will take their full turn. And this will continue until one of the endgame conditions is met, either with the players winning the game or losing the game. Cthulhu Death May Die is played over an undefined number of turns, and during each turn the active player will get to perform their four phases of their turn, and this is going to continue until one of the endgame conditions is met, which are that the players are all going to win if they're able to defeat the final stage of an Elder One, or all the players are going to lose if one of three different conditions is met, which are that an investigator is eliminated before the Elder One is summoned, all investigators are eliminated at any time after the Elder One is summoned, or the progression token reaches the final summoning track space. Moving into the game, our first investigator Elizabeth will start it off as we selected her to be the starting player, and she will proceed through the four phases of her turn, which are to take three actions, then draw a Mythos card and resolve its effects, then investigate or fight, and finally resolve any end of turn effects. From there, then it'll continue on moving to the next player in clockwise order to take their turn. And I'm going to take you through each one of these phases in detail. Before getting into the first action, this is a great opportunity to cover some of the tiles and tokens you're going to be facing. 
So each tile is going to be broken down into one or more rooms, such as this tile here is one room, where this tile down here is three rooms that are separated by little gray walls. Each of these tiles is going to be connected to other tiles by passageways that have a little arrow on them. And a room must be connected to another room by a passageway in order for any model to move through it to that room. Certain passageways will lead off of the board or to areas that do not are not connected, and those passageways cannot be used in your games. So looking at an example of this with our investigator, she could move in from this room here into this room, and then once in this room, she could use this passageway to move into this room or this passageway down here to move into that room. And each of the passageways is going to have those arrows on both sides that you can use, even if it doesn't show a picture of the passageway. So, for example, this room, you could move from this room to that room, as there are arrows on both sides of it. Moving over to tokens, we have the stairs and tunnel tokens, and these are going to make places adjacent, basically. You can use a move action to move from this space here to the other space that has the staircase. And same with the tunnels. The run action is going to allow our investigator to move it to three spaces. Each action must be completed before another action can begin. You cannot interrupt an action to perform another action and then continue with the previous action. And you do not have to use all of the movements in the run action. You can choose to move one, two, or three spaces and then stop. So looking at an example of this, we have our investigator here. And if she chooses to do a run action, she can move from her room going through these passageways again that are connected by the arrows into another room as one movement. Then she can continue moving into this room and then she can finish off in here as that is three spaces. Now there's two important things with this. Each time an investigator moves out of a space that contains enemies, they are going to follow that investigator even if there were other investigators in that room. So if we had a situation like this, the investigator, the, our active investigator moving out of this room would still bring all of the enemies with her. The other important thing is if our investigator moves out of a room that contains fire, not moving into, but out of, then she will take a number of fire tokens from the supply. She will not remove the ones from the room and place those on her board, which she'll have to resolve later on. So putting this all together, let's go ahead and say, for example, that our investigator moves out of there into this room. Then she has two choices. She can move through that passageway or this passageway. So let's say she moves into here, and these will come with her. Finally, she has one movement point left, so she can move into this room here or this room. But because if she leaves this room, then she is going to have to tank a fire token and add it to her board. So let's say that she stops there. The attack action is going to allow your investigator to attack one enemy in your space. When performing this action, you're going to select one of the enemies in your space you wish to target. So with my investigator here, I'm going to go ahead and target the cultist. At that point, you're going to gather up the three black dice, plus any green bonus dice that are granted to you. Go ahead and check your sanity track, and if you have landed on or passed over any thresholds that have the green bonus die, you'll collect one for each of those. Check any skills that you have, if they grant any additional green bonus dice and any items or companions that you have in your discovery cards. There is no limit to the number of green bonus die you'll roll, so if you need more than the five that are given, just note those results and roll those again. At that point then, once you have all the dice you need, go ahead and give it a roll, and for this example, I'm going to go ahead and say that I rolled this result. From here, the Elder Sign is going to count as nothing, as I don't have any skills or abilities that are going to change this to a success, so this is simply considered a blank. I have one tentacle, so it's going to take one sanity on my track, and I have one success. I can choose to spend stress in order to reroll these, and for each stress that I spend, I can reroll one die, and I can continue doing this. So instead of taking sanity damage, let's go ahead and spend a stress and reroll this, this die result. And I rolled a blank. Well, I've only got one success right now, and I'd like to kill that cultist, so I'm going to go ahead and spend another stress and roll again. For this one, let's go ahead and say that this is the result that comes up. So this is going to count as one success and a tentacle. So at this point, we have one sanity damage, so we'll move our sanity marker one space forward, and then we have two successes, so we've done two damage to that cultist, and as you can see on his card, he only has two hit points, so this cultist will be removed. If an enemy is attacked and you don't do enough damage to kill it, you'll simply place a number of health points on it. So if we would have been attacking the Biaki instead that has three hit points, we would have placed two health markers on it instead. 
you can attack multiple times during the turn, up to the maximum of your three actions. The rest action can only be taken in a safe space, which is any space that does not contain any enemy models. So with Elizabeth, she is in a safe space as there are no enemy models in her space. Once that's determined, then a rest action is going to allow our investigator to gain back three points in either health, stress or a combination of. So for example with Elizabeth if she takes a rest action she could gain one health point back and two stress up to a maximum of three points in any way that she wants to spend them for those two tracks. And you can take a rest action multiple times during your turn. The trade action is going to allow any investigators that are in the same space to trade amongst themselves. They can trade any items that they have or companions but they are not allowed to trade conditions. Each time they trade an item or companion, they must trade with the side that they've selected. They cannot choose with, multi, with both sides to take the other side that was not selected originally by the investigator that is trading with them. And you can trade any number of items or companions. You do not have to trade fairly. You can simply give items to other players as well. And any items or companions that grants conditions or bonus skills will go along with them. So for example, with the janitor here, if we trade him, his level of toughness will go with the investigator that it's traded to. The last two actions are always going to be listed on the episode card for the episode you're playing. And each one of those is going to be different, so I'm not going to go through them as each episode is going to provide unique actions that the players can perform to help disrupt the ritual or to do other things. For example, with this one, we have Extinguish Fire, and each one of these actions is going to outline exactly how it's done. So you would make a roll and remove one fire token in your space for each success you rolled. Now that I've covered all the different actions, let me put it all together and show you how this works. So again, we have Elizabeth as the starting player, so she's going to go ahead and start out. She has three actions perform, so she's going to start out by doing an attack action because she has the marksman ability. This allows her to attack a target one space away, and again, those spaces must be adjacent by a connecting passageway. So she's going to go ahead and target one of the cultists there, so we'll hit this guy. And she'll roll those dice. She doesn't get any bonus dice, so she'll just have the three. Okay, so we have a good result. I'm not going to spend any additional stress to re-roll any of those results. So we're going to take one sanity damage, and then we do two damage to a cultist, removing him. Her second action, then, she's going to go ahead and do the same thing. She'll attack that other cultist with her marksman ability. And this time she didn't do quite as well, so we're going to spend a stress to re-roll this tentacle and see if we can get another six. All right, so then we're going to eliminate him. In our final action, we're going to go ahead and move. So I'll move one, two spaces, and I'll finish off here as I don't want to necessarily move into another space with a cultist. Once an investigator has completed their three actions or chooses not to perform any more actions, then they're ready to move on to the second phase of their turn, which is drawing a Mythos card. During this phase, they're going to draw the top card of the Mythos deck and reveal it. So as you can see here, st Star Spawn. So each of these effects is going to be resolved to the best of the player's ability, and then they'll work their way down the card. Starting at the top, we have a Summoning Circle, so this won't have any effect during this phase, but will come into play later on during the Investigator's turn. Next we have, if the star spawn is on the board, each investigator in its space loses two sanity and then it moves two spaces towards you. Currently the star spawn is not out so we do not have to resolve that. And the one other important note with this is anytime the card requires something, it's always to the active player. Unless the card specifically says otherwise, it will not target other investigators, just the active investigator. Finally, at the bottom of the card, we have a summon. So this is going to summon the star spawn in the blue summoning area. So we'll go ahead and place him out on the board. Now, if you have to summon an enemy and you do not have any more in your reserve, then you will not summon that enemy. So, for example, if we would have had both of the fire vampires out and it required us to summon a fire vampire, we could not do that, so we will not complete it as both of them were already out on the board. From there then you're going to discard the card to the discard pile making sure to keep it visible so that you know how many summoning circles you have as that will come into play later on in the turn. The third phase in investigator's turn is the investigate or fight phase. This is going to be dependent upon if your investigator is in a safe space or not. So if your investigator is in a space that contains no enemies then you're going to draw and resolve a discovery card. If there are enemies in your space then you'll resolve a fight instead where the enemies are going to attack you. And I'm going to show you both of these examples. 
So first off, since we are in a safe space, I will show you the discovery card first. So we'll draw and resolve a discovery card. As you can see here, we have the furious student. You'll read the central text. He cannot hurt me anymore. I have a gun. Then it is going to have us choose. You may take one wound to claim either the furious student or the pistol. And if you cannot take the requirements on the card, then I would say you would discard the card and not resolve any effects. So, for example, if it required you to take stress and you had already maxed out your stress, you could not take any and so you could not gain the card. So both of these options are good options as we do have the marksman ability. The pistol is going to be a powerful weapon for Elizabeth. But the companion, companion is also good as he has three hit points that he can use and take damage instead of our investigator. So I'm going to go ahead and take the wounds and I will take the pistol as I really like that ability. That'll give me two green bonus dice each time I attack. So instead, let me take you through the other type of example, the fight. So let's say that there was two cultists in our space with Elizabeth. So instead of drawing and resolving a discovery card, we must resolve a fight. Each cultist will reference their card. So as you can see, you're going to roll two green bonus dice for each cultist and then resolve its effects. Again, you can spend stress to reroll though any of, any of those dice as well any number of times. So let me start off with our first cultist and see what we get. So we got a Elder Sign, which the Cultist does not give us any bonuses. It does not count as a success. So we only have one success on this. So I'm going to go ahead and take that, and I'll take a Wound. The second Cultist will go then, and let's see what he gets. So he got one success and an Elder Sign. So I'm going to go ahead and spend one stress and see if we can get a different result. Still a success, so unfortunately I think I'll just take it instead of spending all my stress to reroll. Once all of the enemies have attacked, then we're ready to move on to the next phase. The one other thing I want to point out is if, for whatever reason, an effect would cause an enemy to move into your space during this turn, that enemy would also attack you. Or if an enemy moves out of your space, then they will no longer attack you. The final phase in Investigator's turn is resolve the end of turn phase. And during this phase, there are five steps the player is going to resolve in order. The first step is to resolve the end of turn effects, and this is going to apply to anything that has end of turn effects except for the Elder One, as his effects will happen later on in the turn. This can be done in any order the active investigator chooses, and each effect must be resolved completely before you resolving another effect. The second step in this phase is fire, so if the active investigator has any fire tokens on that player's dashboard, then they're going to resolve this at that point. So let me say that Elizabeth has two fire tokens on her on her board. She's going to roll one black die for each fire token that she has and resolve the effects of those dice. So let me go ahead and roll and show you what this work, how this works. So with this, again, I can spend stress to re-roll each of these dice any number of times up to the my stress limit. So I'm going to spend one stress and re-roll this one and it comes up as another success. So I'm going to spend one more and re-roll another one. And it comes up as a success again, so I'm going to have to take two wounds as I don't have any stress left. Once you've resolved all of the fire tokens, then you'll go ahead and discard those off of your board. The third step is to check the Mythos discard pile, and if there are three cards in the discard pile that have the Elder One summoning symbol, then the Elder One is going to advance one space. So let me show you how this works, as currently all I have on there is one card, but let me reveal a couple more and show you how this works. So there's our second and the third one. So at this point, during this step, if I have three of the symbols on there, then the Elder One is going to advance one space on that track. And if the Elder One is already on the board, then you're going to advance the progression marker instead. Then I'm going to check my Episode and Elder One cards and see if there are any advancing effects. So with the Episode card, it says anytime the Elder One advances, you're going to place one Fire Token on each Cultist space that does not have one. So we have a couple Cultists out there that, have, that do not have a Fire Token on their space. Next, I'm going to check my Elder One's card, and he does have an Advanced Condition on there I'm going to resolve. So I have, it's going to have me put a Reha token on your space, which is always going to be the active investigator when it refers to a specific investigator. And if that space already has one, then you'll place it on the nearest space that does not have one. Then you're going to summon a cultist on each Reha space. So I'll add a cultist there. 
And then finally, I'm going to move the star spawn one space towards you. If it is not on the board, then you're going to summon it onto the blue gate. So again, it's going to be referring to the active investigator. So our star spawn will move one space towards her by the shortest path. Once you've resolved all those effects, then you can go ahead and gather up all of the cards in the discard pile and reshuffle them in with the Mythos deck each time this happens. The fourth step is to check to see if the Elder One is summoned, and there are going to be two different ways this is going to happen. First off, if the investigators have disrupted the ritual for the episode they're playing, then he'll be summoned during this step, or if he has reached the first red space on the progression track, then he is also going to be summoned. So let me say, for example, that he has reached that first red space, and so during this step, he is going to be summoned. In order to do that, you're going to move the stage one card over. Make sure that you keep it on the table because its effects are in play for the rest of the game and will be resolved any time the progression marker advances. Next, we'll resolve the reveal effects on his next stage card. So it says, when revealed, summon Cthulhu into your space and each enemy on a Reha space moves one space towards you. So Cthulhu would come out onto the active investigator space, and each space can have any number of enemies, so if you can't quite fit him, just keep him off to the side of the board where he's at. Then you're going to place the progression token on there, unless you are like me, and you have it underneath your Elder One. Then, finally, the any enemy that is on a Reha space is going to move one space towards you, and we only have one out, so that is all we have to do there. And then the final step in the turn is the Elder One end of turn effects. So at this point, if the Elder One, any of the Elder One stage cards have end of turn effects, you're going to resolve them at that point. So our second stage does, so we'll resolve that. So it says at the end of each turn, put a Reha token in Cthulhu's space. If there's already one there, then place it in the nearest space that doesn't have one. So our space already has one, so we'll, I'll place it in this space instead. And you're going to resolve the end of turn effects for each stage that is, has been revealed. At that point, the active player's turn is over, and the Mythos deck can be passed to the next player in clockwise order to start their turn. Now that I've taken you through all the different steps in a player's turn, I want to take you through one more example turn with Ahmed here to show you a full turn in action. So to start off, he's going to have his three actions. So I'm going to start off with a run action to let him move up to three spaces. And since he moved out of a space with fire, he is going to gain a fire token. Then I'm going to do the destroy equipment action, which is going to allow me to attack the lab. And with this one, this is not considered an attack, so I won't be able to benefit from anything that would grant me additional dice from attacks. So I'm going to get my three black dice, and I'll go ahead and give them a roll. And I have one success, and I do have the arcane mastery, which is going to count one elder sign as a success as well. So I actually have two, so I'll go ahead and mark that on the board here. And then I'm going to go ahead and roll again for my last action. I'll go ahead and do the destroy equipment again. And this time I got two successes and a couple of sanity damage. So I'm going to go ahead and spend one stress and try to re-roll this one. And it comes up as a blank. So that works out. I only take one sanity damage. And I do two more damage, which is enough to destroy that lab token. So then I'll flip it over and reveal it. So this is a safe collapse, and I'm going to heal all my stress. So that was pretty handy. From there, that is my last action for my first phase. So I'm going to move into the second phase where I'll draw a Mythos card. And this is the Byaki. So it has a summoning circle. Each Byaki moves directly to your space. So he's going to move in here. And then I'm going to summon one in the red spawn zone. So I uh, already have one there, so I don't have any more, and that is all I can do. So this will be discarded. Then I'll move into the third phase, which is Investigator Fight. I definitely have to fight as I have enemies in my space. So let's start off with the Cultist. So he's going to roll two green. And we got two successes. So I'm going to spend a stress to reroll this one here. And it comes up the same. I'll spend one more and see if we can try to change that. It's That cultist is not going to be shaken off. So next we have the Byaki, and he gets two greens and a black. And the Elder Signs are also going to count for successes with his attacks. I got two again, and I'm going to spend another stress to try to stop one of those from getting through. So let's see what happens. And it's an Elder Sign, so I'm going to spend my last stress and see if I can change. And no luck there. So two more hits. Achmed is getting hammered here. All right, so that is it for that. Then 
I will move into the final phase, which is the resolving end of turn. First off, we don't have any end of turn effects currently. Next, we have fire, so I do have a fire damage that could potentially knock me out here. And of course, it is a success. So with this, I'm going to go ahead and count this as a blank. Otherwise, my investigator would die, and this would be into the game. So I'm going to count it as a blank instead. So then I'll remove the fire token. The next step is to consult the discard pile. We only have two summoning circles, so there won't be any advance. Then next we check to see if the Elder One comes out, which currently he is not going to. We haven't disrupted Ritual yet, and he hasn't moved into that first space of the red track. So then the final step is again to check the Elder One and see if we have any end of turn effects, which currently we do not. So this is the end of Ahmed's turn, and he does have a special ability that says at the end of your turn, you may heal one stress or one wound. We definitely want to heal a wound as, as he almost went out there. So that is the end of his turn. He'll pass the Mythos deck over to the next player in clockwise order to start their turn. So the next thing I want to go over is death of an investigator. So when an investigator is killed or consumed by madness, the game is immediately lost if the Elder One is still on the summoning track. Now, if, however, the Elder One is already out on the board, then that player is simply eliminated and the other players can continue playing the game. The one other important thing with this is if the Investigator dies during their turn, you're going to skip all of the following turn phases except for the Check the Mythos card discard pile phase. If there are three Elder One summoning symbols, the Elder One is going to advance and its effects are going to be applied. And from this point on, that, that player's turn is simply skipped until the end of the game. Another thing I want to take a look at is disrupting the ritual. So each of the episodes is going to outline how you do that. With this particular episode, I have to destroy four out of the five labs that are out there. So once I've achieved that, then I have disrupted the ritual. And at that point, then I can do damage to Elder One. Now, if he has not been summoned yet, then at this point, during that next time when you would check to see if he is summoned, he will be summoned. And if he is already out at this point, then you can actually do damage to him at this point. If the Elder One comes out and you have not disrupted the ritual yet, you are not able to do damage to him. He's completely immune to all attacks and all damage. I also want to go into some more detail about insanity cards, leveling up, and thresholds. And one other thing I want to point out real quick is that anytime you gain sanity damage and you hit a threshold, any additional sanity damage you gain during that roll is disregarded or another effect that causes it. So for example, let me say that we rolled this result here, which would be three sanity damage onto our track. So when we move the first one up, taking care of the first sanity, the last two are going to be disregarded as we hit a threshold during this effect. At this point, we are going to trigger our insanity card. So with this one, it says that all monsters on the board are going to move one space towards you. And then if there are no monsters in your space, you can heal all of your stress. You're also going to choose one of your skills and gain a level in it. So for Ahmed here, we're going to go ahead and add one to his healing prayer. And this is going to instead increase him so that he can heal any two of any combination of stress and wounds. So he is really good at healing himself or other investigators that are in his space. When fighting the Elder One, you're going to be working through the stages trying to do damage to eliminate each stage. So let me say that it is Elizabeth's turn, and she's going to attack Cthulhu. So with this, he has 11 damage already on his stage 2 card. And so let's go ahead and say that she rolls this result here. So this is going to count as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 successes on him. He only needs to take one more damage in order to eliminate this stage, so we'll go ahead and take care of that. Any additional damage beyond the 12 is simply lost for that attack. So this would be moved over. And then we would resolve the when revealed part of his stage 3, and that would have a full 12 hit points. Now the other thing, let's go ahead and say that during the third step, Cthulhu is in Elizabeth's space, so he is going to attack her. So when determining what he's going to roll, you're going to consult each of his stage cards. So he is going to have one green die for stage 3. Stage 2 is going to get him two green and two black. And then stage 1 does not provide him with anything. So then he would roll and see what he did with this. And this continues even with stage four adding another green and another black die. So as he levels or goes through his stages, he becomes even nastier when he attacks as well. And the final thing I want to go over is endgame conditions. So all the players are going to win the game if they're able to defeat the Elder One's final stage. 
This is even going to happen if at the same time the last investigator dies or is consumed by madness as the elder one dies. In that situation, the players are still going to win the game. Now, there are three ways the investigators are going to lose the game. The first is if an investigator dies before the elder one is summoned, then all the investigators lose the game. The second way is if all the investigators are killed or consumed by madness after the elder one is summoned. And the final way is if the progression token reaches the last space on the summoning track. And again, the progression token is the token here. So if it reaches that last space and the investigators have taken too long and the elder one has reached his full power and eliminates them and they all lose the game. Well, I hope you found this video helpful. If you have any questions or comments, leave those in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to watch my videos and leave me feedback on them. I do really appreciate it and I take into account everything you guys say to make the best possible videos. If you found this video helpful, if you like what I do, please consider that like button subscribe to my channel as it really does make a big difference, helps me to continue to grow and produce these videos. Until next time, I'll see you guys later.